Once upon a time, in a faraway land called Blackmoor, there was perfect harmony where everybody lived in a post-scarcity economy. Their every want was granted through the magic of technology. Didn't matter what they desired. It could be easily provided. Nothing was off limits. Robots. Monkeys. Butlers. Robot monkey butlers. But some people looked at all the awesomeness that was Blackmoor and decided they didn't need antibiotics, public transportation, air conditioning, minimal government interference, King Ranch chicken, and GPS. That last one would come back and bite them hard. Those people were called elves, and instead they preferred to stay away from Blackmoor and live in crude villages far from all the wonders civilization had to offer. But then Blackmoor mysteriously exploded, probably from an elf tourist shouting, hey, what's this button do? That leads us to today's topic. Welcome to Mastara. I'm Mr. Welch, and let's talk about the elven migrations. This one's going to be beefy because Mastara loves elves, and it loves scattering all the information across multiple books, like nine of them. And I still don't know where some of the elves came from. That's what has been taking so long on this video. All the elves were refugees from Blackmoor, with a few exceptions like the Belkades. The Great Reign of Fire stands out from all the other D&D holocausts because we don't know what caused it. The Reign of Colorless Fire in the Mornlands happened because of a war. The Realms and Dragonlands showed us what happens when you try to cut in line to become a god. The Great Conjunction in Ravenloft was due to a power struggle from a desperate Dark Lord. The Great Reign of Fire was none of those. As far as Blackmoor was concerned, it wasn't from some great experiment or power grab. They were already at the top of the world. They were centuries ahead of everyone else technologically. They didn't need to prove anything to anyone. As far as the people of Blackmoor were concerned, the Great Reign of Fire was Tuesday. The elves had started to turn away from Blackmoor's technology years before it went nuclear. They feared the spread of technology and what it was doing to the planet. It's not like Blackmoor was playing around with the tech they had just discovered. This happened a thousand years after the Beagle allied with King Uther. Blackmoor had been using these tools and weapons for centuries. But you know the basics. Blackmoor blows up, the planet shifts on its axis, and everybody runs for their lives. At least the ones that weren't automatically turned to ash in the explosion. The Immortals tried to save who they could, but unlike other civilizations in the Hollow World, Blackmoor wasn't on a decline. There was no lingering society to preserve. One minute Ka was wondering if there were any animals being driven to extinction that he should save in the next decade, and the next, he was staring at a mushroom cloud the size of Europe. He was able to save the Black Lore Elves as they were some distance from Blackmoor, but that was it. The rest of the elves had to run for it on their own. The elves initially lived in a kingdom called Evergrun in the region of Grunland before the rise of Blackmoor. The Aquarindi elves were living in the oceans as well at this point. In 4000 BC, Blackmoor allied with the Beagle and gained independence from the Thonian Empire. With the help of the Beagle's technology, they conquered Thonia and expanded across the globe. Around 3500 BC, the elves are split between those embracing technology and those thinking it's becoming dangerous. The latter start distancing themselves physically from Blackmoor. Around 3100 BC, the Aquarindi Elves, attracted to Blackmoor, also started fearing the increasing power of the Empire and returned to the sea. The Elves that had returned to Evergrund in the region now known as Volcania remained there for about 200 years before they realized the planet had stopped shifting on its axis and they were now in the Arctic. They reasoned they had best find shelter quickly or they would freeze to death. A few Elves remained, but between the cold and the coming of the various humanoids and other monsters, they didn't survive long. The survivors headed north, as their homeland was now firmly in the Arctic after the planetary shift. Ilsendol led the refugees, hoping to find warmer climes and other survivors. Unfortunately, all he found were humans, and since they weren't elves, he kept marching on, leaving them to their fate. The core of the elves traveled north through modern-day Devania before they skipped across the ocean into Brun via the Arm of the Immortals. Then Ilsendol, too proud to ask for directions, headed east across the Orkshead Peninsula through the Savage Coast until they ran into the Black Mountains. Whereupon the elves started complaining about the enormous amounts of climbing they were about to do and wimped out, heading north to find a pass between the mountains. This being Mastara, and where the original cartographers had a mountain fetish, they were unable to do so. The elves looped back and started heading west because surely there weren't as many mountains there. They crossed mile after mile of savanna, barely seeing a tree. After years of walking, they finally arrived at their worst nightmare, which hid their home. The Severo Krebit Mountain Range. These monsters made the Black Mountains look like they were foothills. Many elves asked the immortals if they were getting paid by the mountain, because this was getting ridiculous. Then they thought back to how much easier this trip would have been if they'd kept some of the Blackmoor technology, because a GPS would have been so much more helpful than just roaming around for 700 years, crossing the continent twice, just to find a forest. It had been multiple centuries since the elves had left Grunland, and now they're staring at another round of extreme rock climbing. Fortunately, this time they were able to find a pass carved by a glacier, and behind this pass was a verdant forest with everything the elves needed to thrive, and no more rock climbing or so it would seem. The elves frolicked among the trees in the newfound sylvan realms, slowly expanding their numbers, not because of any population control or agreed-upon breeding programs, 
but because the only thing the elves disliked more than sex was sex with other elves. They didn't grow their population very fast, but eventually, after 1300 years, they discovered they needed to expand outward, only to find out that greedy human developers had taken all the suburbs. They had two options. First, go out and find a new, better homeland. The second one was to dress as ghosts and scare away all the humans to drive down the property values and buy up all the land cheap. This plan was thwarted by a plucky young Lupin adventurer and his four human sidekicks, so it was time for the elves to find a new home. The elves had discovered the rainbow, and after tasting it, realized it was not a new form of candy, but instead a portal they could take to new lands. Many elves searched for new homes across the continent before deciding on the lands in northwestern Thyatis. Not like the humans were using those lands after all. But again, the elves were wrong, and soon the humans began expanding into the region with their strong shoulders, sultry eyes, and healthy constitutions. The elves started feeling revulsion towards humans and their natural sexiness and again fled. Except for Clan Vialia, who was tired of running and decided to hide in the forest where they could watch the humans from afar. Until one of the emperors asked the elves to teach the humans the way of the foresters and back it up with a lot of gold. Clever elves, the Viala. The clans had started to splinter around this time because many of them were tired of walking. It had been 2,000 years since the elves fled Evergrun, and for the elves, it had only been for a few generations. Every time they passed a forest, some of them demanded to stop. Finally, one of the clans had had enough of one excuse after another on why the next forest wasn't good enough and decided to stay. Clan Kalari found a lovely forest in northern Trolladara and had decided they had walked enough. They kept to themselves and left the humans alone, at least until after the rise of Duke Stefan, when they showed up to support him. The elven leader Meliadin had taken the elves into central Derekin, where he declares that the elves have their new homeland in the middle of a scrub forest. The elves looked at the few scrappy trees there and thought their king had gone loopy. But then he announced the start of weather-changing magical ceremonies, and soon rain is pouring into the land, and the trees of life that the elves have taken with them begin the growth of the Candlebarth forest. While many leagues away, the Nithians are wondering, where's all the rain gone? In 800 BC, Alfheim was born, with the magical forest springing up out of nowhere, with absolutely no water-stealing magic involved at all, and you can't prove it. Then 800 years later, the last of the Alfheim clans arrived in the forest with Clan Fialadiel, the ones that stayed behind in the Sylvan Realm because they were so past mountains and walking and all that. Humans had grown envious of the now depopulated Elven Kingdom and decided to build a new mini-mart in the forest. One thing led to another, and the Elves were driven out, following the Rainbow Portal to find the homes of all their distant cousins, where they acted like they'd always been close. And people wonder why nobody trusts Elves. That explains the Elves of Alfheim and where they came from, not to mention the Kalari and the Vialia clans. But Mastara has a lot of Elves. Seriously, it has a ton of them. That's what's taking this video so long to write, I had to track down every single elf clan, and I had to consult nine different books to get the whole story. Some elves, specifically in the Savage Coast, just appeared. No idea where they came from, but I will blame the original elf migrations and just said some clans dropped out during the long walk. It doesn't fix the culturalist demi-humans of that region, but it does explain where some of them came from. The elves of Windar are initially two different clans of elves. The Gefrenel elves left their homeland long before the Great Reign of Failure, since they had access to GPS, when they decided to head out to see what the world entailed, they settled in an area just south of modern Windar. When Blackmore went kablooey, the Windar elves started getting sick from all the fallout, but were saved by the creation of the Elven Star, an artifact that kept them from getting radiation sickness. But they needed to find a new, slightly less glowing homeland. Meanwhile, back in Evergrun, a separatist clan of elves set off to find a new home and again, with the help of GPS technology, made a beeline where the Grefinel elves were living even though they didn't know that the elves still existed. Led initially by the elven sage Ginnelith, the expedition fell under the leadership of Inerith after his master discovered grizzlies don't like it when you grab them by the scruff of the neck, being asked who's a good bear, and then trying to play Raz Raz with them. In 2120 BC, the future Windar elves settled into their new homeland. In 1800 BC, they discovered the remains of the Grafenel clan, who after some time grew to trust the new elves. Everybody moved in and lived happily ever after, with the exceptions of a few invasions and genocides that fall outside the scope of this video. Then moving on to the Shadow Elves. These poor bastards have had some of the worst luck of all the elves. There's a minor continuity problem with their original starting timeline, but I'm going with the Shadow Elf book. They were several clans living in Evergrown when the big Kablooey hit. They stuck around a little bit longer than Isildel's clan, and as a result had to flee as their homeland was turning into the wider parts of Sweden. They got lost trying to find the larger bunch of elves, because again, no GPS. Because they didn't take the left turn at Jabul, they ended up in the mountains. Only it wasn't the Black Mountains that their kin ran into. It was the Colossus Mountains of Glantry. There they realized they would not go mountain climbing in a region with the Kurish Massif, a range at its widest point of 1,368 miles, 
by 1,056 miles. Then you've got the Windarn Mountains in the north, and Glantry becomes Fantasy Denver. I'm starting to think all the mountains were placed there specifically to annoy elves. Pretty sure that Kagiar was just raising mountain after mountain for his own sadistic pleasure, as the elves did everything they could to go around the mountains, and he would just add another mountain at the end of the first one. That would explain so much. The four clans of the future Shadow Elves get to Glantry and find out they need a new homeland that is preferably radiation free, and the only place they can find is underground. They use magic to grow the seeds they brought with them underground, and were content to wait out the mini ice age that was going on above ground. In 2200, other elves arrive from Evergreen trying to escape the devastation, but they only find the surface dominated by ice and humanoids. They don't know their cousins were safely below ground, drinking mushroom wine and dreaming of their lost robot monkey butlers. These elves were quickly set upon by humanoids, and either died from orc axes or froze to death in the mountains. A few survived, but not enough to last as a culture. In 1950 BC, a small group of shadow elves crawled out from the fallout to see what the world had turned into. They found themselves alone, with no other elves in sight on account of the other elves being dead and all that. They started to settle the surface once again before discovering a long-lost Blackmore device in what would become the Broken Lands. Unfortunately for the elves, the machine had a lot of pretty blinking colored buttons and they couldn't help but start pressing those buttons, hoping it was a GPS to see what would happen. Nuclear Holocaust is what happened. The elves fled back underground where the mushrooms were in the shape of mushrooms and not clouds. The elves started to explore the world below further and discover the city of Angmar, where they drove out the original occupants. For a while, the world was their burrito, as they thrived in the city, protected from outside threats by a vast lake of lava that surrounded the city. But the city was founded by followers of Edzantiotl, who felt the elves weren't getting corrupted fast enough and decided to speed things up by flooding the cavern with poisonous gas. The elves fled again, and this time finding the teachings of Raphael, and eventually the city of stars and the surrounding areas where they now live. In Minrathad, the elves that settled there were splinter groups from Isindol, who left behind the other elves following a different sphere of power. The clans of Verdir and Meditor decided to go east instead of west sometime during the Great Elven Migration on Davania. They ended up in future Karamikos in 2100 BC, the exact same time as the founding of the Sylvan Realm. So the two clans split from the other elves while they are founding a kingdom on the opposite side of the map, and then book it to an unexplored region in record time, several millennia before the other clans of the region arrive. They must have had a functioning GPS or something, because otherwise that snarl is going on the list. Here the elves frolicked for 500 years before the elemental chaos tore their land apart, and the elves found themselves either on a new island, or having their property value go way up as they now lived on beachfront property. 20 years after this, the elves of Clan Verdier, who didn't like living on the beach, built ships and joined their cousins on the Isles of Dread. Not THE Isle of Dread, but the Minrathad chain called the Isles of Dread. It gets confusing quickly keeping track of the two, it's not like this was written at the same time as Isle of Dread. And the Gazetteer refers to one of the islands as Dread Isle, but that's ancient history and is never mentioned again. Nor should it be. Then we hit the elves that seemingly appeared out of nowhere, the Belkides of Glantry. We know they came from Devania, and past that, nothing. They have a similar culture to the Savage Baronies, but don't have any connection past that similarity. Those elves were left behind during Isindel's meanderings, and the Belkides made a beeline for Glantry at a later date. They were not one of Isindel's followers, that part is made explicitly clear in the Glantry book. They shared part of a culture with another group with no ties to them, and they were not part of the initial elven migration. There are at least six different fan theories on the vaults about the Belkadees, none of which are anything more than fan speculation. They could have been from another plane of existence, like Mythic Earth, similar to the French and the Scots of Mystara. It explains why they're constantly cosplaying like the Corsican brothers in D&D, the Cheech and Chong version, not the Douglas Fairbanks Jr. version. Sure, the Fairbanks version is by far the superior film, but Cheech and Chong capture the Spanish vibe better, even if the Spain is set decades after the French Revolution. Other options are the elves for an unknown migration from Evergreen years after Isindel left. We know they arrived well before 635 AC, as they were in Glantry before the Erewhon elves appeared. The Flames called the newly arrived elves Pale Ones, which had to be Erewhon elves, because no one's going to call a Belkadiz elf Pale. Skipping right past the mystery of the Belkides, we do know much about the Erewhon Elves. They arrived in 735 AC after a political schism in Alfheim. They skipped over to the forest of Glantry, fortunately with no mountains getting added along the way. There they settled into the large forested region in the nation, which wasn't much, but considering the rest of Glantry, it might as well have been the big thicket. They were one of the last elven groups to experience a large migration. The Shylar Elves of Alphacia are another one with glaring continuity problems. It is known they are one of the original elven clans from Evergreen, 
and they left with Isindol because they have their own tree of life. So how did they end up on another continent? No clue. The best theory I could find was they made it to the Sylvan Realms, and after a serious falling out with the other elves, they noped off to Shylar and Alphacia. And it was everything they needed, but they were so aggravating to the other clans, nobody even bothered to check up on them. They were just glad that the Shylar elves were gone. This happens at an unspecified time before the arrival of the Alphacians. Then we get to the Forest Home Elves, who have been mentioned less than anyone else. Seriously, we only know their name because they were briefly mentioned on the Alphacian map. We have nothing to go on. Are they friendly? Probably not, they're elves. Popular speculation has them as isolationists, content to live alone in their forest and not playing nice with anybody. They probably split from the Shylar elves over how to deal with other people, and now they occupy another part of Alphacia, keeping all but a select few out. They were an Evergrun clan, but they split from that region before splitting with the Sylvan Realm Elves, and finally with the Shylar Elves. Don't expect a warm welcome when you get there. Elven migration was a pain to keep track of. Mustara has a lot of elves. Far more than any other demi-human race. Actually, more than the other demi-human races combined. You've got three races of dwarves, two gnomes, and the hen. The elves beat that by just shedding stragglers on their way up north. Granted, this video would have been a lot shorter if Isindel had a GPS, but since batteries have died on all Blackmore era devices by now, can't complain about it now. This was a deep dive into a topic that needed to be compiled into one place. It doesn't give all the answers because several elves don't have all the answers. But that information can be added if required by the Dungeon Master. Okay, I'm done with this video, but I still need to catch up on the ones I'm behind on because of Wizards of the Coast misbehaving and real-life work intruding. The next video up is all about the Yazak Steppes, the northern plains of the Savage Coast, with all the goblins and orcs and siren flowers. But until next time, remember always check your house for, for elves, lest they move in and start using up all the hot water. Just ask Yalarum.